the Prophet, he recited the Quran. Mm. Quran didn't come down as one book, it came down in 23 years. Right? It was it was a circumstantial revelation too. So people came asking questions and revelation came down on the Prophet, spoke the Quran, right? Mm. Recited the Quran. So what happened is every time the Prophet recited the Quran, he had companions which called writers of revelation. Mm. They used to write it down. And they used to do something else which is memorizing it. So the Muslims yeah, memorize yeah. the entire Quran, millions yeah, of yeah. people, yeah? I know some people who actually know the whole... Yeah, 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 memorize the whole Quran, right? Crazy. Yes, yes. They, and then actually if you go to Ramadan, you know, if you go to oh, any yeah, mosque, yeah, yeah. if you go to any mosque, you'd see that they are reciting the Quran from beginning to end in 30 parts. Any mosque around the UK, around the world, you know? So what happens is this is the traditions that Muslims have. Whenever they pray, they recite the part of the Quran, which is a process of daily authentication from the time of the Prophet. Which means you can you cannot change anything. If you change it, you go to any mosque, people will correct you. Exactly. Say this is wrong. We know this is. We memorize it. What you're reciting is wrong. Do you get the yeah, point? That's and that's why this way is the way that Muslims know the Quran is the same thing the Prophet was reciting, right? Because it's millions of people, not one or two people. You can change. It's millions of people. The second thing is I said that there is the written scripture. You have the Sanaa manuscript, top copy manuscript. Birmingham here, which is a manuscript that they have here, is it, it is from the time of the Prophet himself. Right? And it's in Birmingham Museum, you can go see it, you know, it's really? carbon dated to the life of the Prophet himself, you know. Really? And it is the same as we have today, which is all of these are evidences that the Quran is preserved completely. While the previous scriptures, there has been additions, there has been alterations, there have been, yeah, there's been twists in the scripture, you know. So what we say is Allah sent Prophet Muhammad as the last and final messenger, and he sent the Quran with him so he can bring us back to the truth. Because those who change this, uh, things in the other scriptures, how would you know what is right and wrong? Mm. You wouldn't. So the Quran is a criteria for you. See. Whatever agrees with the Quran, then we know this is actually true. It happened. Whatever disagree, we know that the people have changed, uh, manipulated these things. Like there are things mentioned, evil things mentioned about prophets mm. in the Bible, for example, in the Old Testament. We don't believe that. We believe prophets were righteous people chosen by God. If they did all of these evil things, then no one would want to learn from them, exactly. right? Because why would I take them as an example and learn from them if they're doing evil themselves, right? But prophets were the best amongst their, their people. And that's why what they taught is what people wanted to learn, right? So that's what Muslims believe. So the Quran will always bring you back to this idea into what is correct and what is false. Also, we have what we call the Hadith, which is uh, the statements of the Prophet, the tradition of the Prophet. You know, other religions, they have the problem of, of how, uh, okay, your interpretation of the Quran, this is my interpretation of the Quran. Each person's interpretation, oh, yeah, you know? Yeah, when yeah. I speak to Christians, everyone has his own mm, idea of mm. Christianity. You get the point? Yeah, yeah. But what Muslims have is something else. We have that the Prophet is the one who tells us how to understand the Quran. So we have literally his life, which is the Hadith. Hundreds of thousands of, of uh, narrations of people describing how the Prophet lived his life, how they practice the Quran. So we can know how to practice the Quran. So for us, it's the Prophet and his companions. How did they follow the Quran is how we should follow the Quran. So no one can come and say, I understand it this way. We say, did the Prophet do this? Mm. The companions do this? They say, no. We say, okay, then we don't accept it. No interpretation. Yes, your interpretation is irrelevant to us exactly. because what the Prophet did is what is important, you know? You might have certain interpretations and things which are recent. Like for example, TV, things that didn't exist in the past. So what the scholars use the scripture to come into a ruling regarding these things, right? Uh, should we deal with them? Should we not deal with them, right? But the main foundations, you have to go back to the Prophet, you have to go back to the companions, you cannot bring your own interpretation and, and what you think is true and bring it into the scripture, right? So, uh, what about you? Do you believe, do you th does that make sense to you? What I'm telling you, does it make sense to you? I so, yeah, because it's so, it's so original and it can't be, it can't be changed or interpreted yes. in any way. Right? Yes. It's at its core, it's at its purest. Like, yes, yes, exactly. Right? And that's what makes it unique. And we say that each prophet brings evidences and signs mm. to demonstrate that they are a messenger sent, sent from the Creator, right? So these messengers don't just come and say, I'm a messenger for me, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because anyone can make that claim, right? They also bring evidences to demonstrate that they are prophet and messenger sent from the Creator, you know? I'm sure you heard about some stories of other prophets doing certain things, signs to show the people that they are prophets and messengers of God, like Moses splitting the sea, all of these stories that you heard, right? So Prophet Muhammad also brought his own type of evidence to demonstrate to the people that he's a messenger coming from the Creator sent by Allah, right? So uh, one of them was that this Quran cannot be imitated in the Arabic language. That people, if they try to bring something like it, they wouldn't be able, right? Another thing was that this Quran that you see talks about the physical world, the physical reality, talks about the universe, talks about existence, you know? And we're learning today through our advancement in science to, about the world, right? The Quran has certain things that it describes the world uh, 1,400 years ago, 
talks about the world, it talks about the universe. And if it was from this Bedouin Arab, I'll have a lot of mistakes. Mm. Because the knowledge of the people 1,400 years ago about the world was wrong, right? Yeah. Like many people believe the world is flat, for example, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Many people believe the, the, you know, like the Hindu scripture believe that the sun has seven horses yeah. pulling it. Yeah. The earth is, uh, has two ball horns that are holding it. Do you get the point? Yeah, 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 so yeah. they had very ridiculous beliefs about the world because this was their knowledge. So if this was coming from a man who wasn't a prophet, you would have a lot of mistakes within it. Would you agree? Exactly, agree. But what we find is that the Quran is consistent with the reality. Rather, it's telling us things that we did not know about the reality we're learning today. Like for example, the Quran is talking about the universe and how the universe is expanding. You know, we learned that recently in the 1900s, we learned the universe is expanding. Now the question would be, how would Prophet Muhammad 1,100 years ago know about this, you know? <laughs> And, and the people who learn, who knew this, they got the Nobel Prize. While it is mentioned in the Quran all of this time, you know? Uh, the Quran talks about mountains and how they have deep roots within the earth. Today we knew two things because the Quran describes a mountain. How would you describe a mountain to me? Let me ask you this. How would you describe a mountain? I'd say just a large rock. Yeah, it's a large pile of rocks, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But imagine if you, in the tourist, 21st century, you're describing this way. Imagine what a Bedouin Arab, without any knowledge of yeah, geology yeah, yeah. and science, how would he describe it? Prophet Muhammad, the Quran, which we believe God is describing uh, the mountains. God, Allah is describing them to be pigs. You know when you have um, a tent and you put the pigs in the, in the tent, right? The pigs do two functions, they have two functions. First, we know that the pigs, uh, majority of it is under earth, right? Yeah. Is, is under the grass, it's not above. There's the only small part that is, that is up. The second thing we know that it's stabili stabilizing the tent. That's why we use it, right? It's to stabilize the tent. Mountains exactly have these two functions as pegs do to a tent exactly. So the mountains have deep roots within the earth. Like mountain Everest goes so deep in, in the earth, you know? And the second thing is that mountains stabilize the earth because mountains push the, the what we call the crust. You have the crust, you have the upper mantle, you have the lower mantle. So the upper man, um, mantle is moving literally and the crust is moving above. And when the crust moves, you have tectonic plates colliding and you have earthquakes. So when the mountains push the crust, there is less earthquakes taking place. Therefore, it's a called isostasy. It's a, a scientific term for, for it. Isostasy, which, which is mountains are actually stabilizing there. How would Prophet Muhammad 1,400 years ago know about this? That's crazy. You know? That's crazy. <laughs> See, he wouldn't know about these things, right? And the Quran talks about other things like, uh, do you know uh, embryology? The baby in the mother's womb, how is it developing a stage by stage until it becomes a human being? Professor Keith Moore, who's a Christian, embryologist, he studied the embryology in the Quran and he said that Prophet, he's a Christian, but he said Prophet Muhammad has to be a prophet sent by God. He said this information on embryology that we're learning today, his time, in the 90, late 90s, uh, he's saying, how would this man know it if he was not a prophet of God? He would not know how we as humans develop in our mother's womb a stage by stage. You get the point? So all of this is what we call evidences and proofs. There's other evidences and proofs, right? But these are evidences and proofs to show that Prophet Muhammad is actually a messenger of God. Someone who is sent by the Creator to deliver this message to human beings and who has the authority from God. Because if he doesn't have authority, then he would not have evidences to substantiate his claim. Do you agree? Right. Yeah. So if that makes sense to you, then why don't you become Muslim then? <laughs> yeah, 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 well, I'm really, I'm open-minded, so yeah. Yeah, it's good. Okay, if it makes sense to you, if it makes sense to you, if you want to become Muslim, you can become Muslim now. Yeah, but yeah there is no problem. I'll tell you something, it's very easy to become Muslim. It's testifying that Allah is the one creator, the God that I described to you. is not a man or woman, not like his creation. And to, this, to testify that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger through the evidences that we talked about. And then if you say that, you become Muslim, literally, right? And because Islam is easy. Allah is sending this message because He wants people to get paradise. He wants people to get rewarded. And anyone who dies upon the, the Islamic faith is eventually going to enter paradise, right? So if you say after me, I testify. If you say after me, I testify. There is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I testify the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger and servant. You see, it's crazy. <laughs> now you say the same thing after me, but in Arabic. You say, Ash, Hadu, An, La, Ilaha, Illa, Allah. Wa Ash, Hadu, Anna, Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. That's it, you're Muslim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give you a hug, no problem. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thanks a lot for so, this. So, no problem. I'll give you a few books. I'll take your contact details as well. Uh, so we can uh, 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 teach you how to pray, how to do ablution, step by step, you know. 
The most important thing I want to tell you is this, is take things step by step, right? Do not push two things because if you put, if you have too many, too many things in your mind, then you get confused, you get the point, then it becomes overwhelming for you. I want you to take things step by step, step by step, right? So I'll take your number, I'll give you a book to read in the beginning and then read the Quran while you do that and a few of my brothers will contact you, right? Whenever you feel like it, you can come, we'll teach you how to do, how to practice the religion, everything like that. Can you give me the new Muslim guide? Is here, yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> He's happy for you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>